last night was the NFL draft round one. And uh, I know that not all of you are football fans, but if you were a football fan, you were probably watching to see what would happen. And uh, the Cleveland Browns had the number one draft pick because they are by far the worst football team around these days. And, you know, I, I kind of feel for Cleveland fans uh, because they've had a rough go in some areas. Of course, these days with basketball and baseball, they're a little cockier. Yeah, and the Buckeyes. Okay, I get all of that. But, but really, you know, sometimes when people are being particularly obnoxious about LeBron James and how wonderful uh, the Cavaliers are, I posterize them, at least I think I posterize them, by using just a simple couple of phrases. I say, oh, you remember the drive and the fumble? <laughs> It's cruel. It's totally cruel. If you're a Cleveland Browns fan, as bad as things are these days, you remember the drive and the fumble. Now, for those of you that don't know what that means, let me briefly tell you. Uh, back when the guy over my shoulder, John Elway, was playing football for the Denver Broncos, um, the Broncos and the Browns met two years running for the AFC Championship, the right to go to the Super Bowl. And uh, back in those days, uh, those were the two best AFC teams. Now, in the first year that they met, the game was held in Cleveland, and um, the Broncos were down by uh, four, five, six points, uh, no, seven points, I'm sorry, seven points with less than two minutes to go. They had the ball on Cleveland's two-yard, on their own two-yard line, so they had 98 yards to go. No timeouts. John Elway runs into the huddle. They've got 98 yards ahead of them, and he says to, <laughs> he says to his teammates, uh, we've got him right where we want him. And of course, the other guys are like, you're so crazy. But Elway was young and kind of crazy, and the miracle is he drives the team 98 yards with no timeouts. With the, sec the clock expiring, he throws a touchdown to Mark Jackson in the end zone. Extra point is good. They go to overtime. Broncos kick a field goal and overtime. They win the game. Cleveland goes home again, not to go to the Super Bowl. Now, what most people don't know about this is that uh, Denver goes on to the Super Bowl and gets demolished. I mean, horrible, horrible. And I talked about that a couple of uh, weeks ago when I talked about Elway. Okay. Fast forward a whole year. The Browns have had a whole year to think about this. It's pretty miserable. They've got a great quarterback of their own, a guy by the name of Bernie Kosar, and they've got a great running back by the name of uh, Ernest Biner. All right, now, uh, as it turned out, back in that year, my family, and I grew up in Denver, my family had season tickets to the Broncos, and my father, in a moment of altruistic uh, kindness, allowed Sarah and I to use his seats uh, to go to the championship game. Now, he wasn't all that kind. He was sitting up in the warm press box with what my mother called his third wife, which my mother called the anorexic little cookie. And the anorexic little cookie didn't like football. So she's sitting in the press box at the AFC championship game reading a book. Okay. I mean, really, are you kidding me? It had snowed the night before in Denver. And as I remember it, the snow was somewhere between our ankles and our shins on the, the ground. And Denver did not have, this was not luxury boxes. Uh, this was, you were just sitting on, you know, really not great seats. And it's really super cold. And if you've ever tried to make a lot of noise clapping your hands with gloves, not much happens. So people were roaring and yelling. And of course, most of the people out there were drunk. There was a guy called the Barrel Man. He used to walk around wearing nothing but a barrel. He was so drunk, he didn't know how cold it was. Very nice guy, but you know, there you go. In any event, the game was another nail biter and Denver held a lead with just a couple of minutes to go in the game. And this time Cleveland had the ball and Cleveland starts marching for what will inevitably be the winning touchdown. And Denver didn't have a great defense that year. It was good enough, but it wasn't great. And so the crowd was clearly nervous that things were not going well and not going to go well. So Cleveland's marching down the field and we're now down to just a few seconds to go. And Cleveland's got the ball. They've got to score a touchdown. And they hand the ball off to this great running back, Ernest Biner. Suddenly, at that moment, all of a sudden, in my memory, Carl Mecklenburg, a linebacker for the Denver Broncos, starts jumping up and down and pointing. We have no idea what's going on. We can't see that well down there. But what's happened is Biner has fumbled the ball. He's fumbled the ball on the Denver one-yard line, and Denver has recovered. The drive and the fumble. Oh, 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 it hurts. It hurts so bad. If you want to make a Cleveland fan cry, just say the drive and the fumble. All right, now, besides the fact that I wanted to torment a few of you just momentarily uh, before you get too excited about your draft picks last night, there's actually a connection to the bar review. And here's the connection. Some of you 
are in a position to score a touchdown and you fumble. Some of you are going to fumble. I had a conversation with a Florida bar taker who failed uh, this last exam. And it was a painful conversation in the sense that this individual had done really well on the first two essays in Florida, had scored over the mean. These were passing results. But on the third essay, it just dropped off the table. It was terrible. And when I said to this student, what happened? He said, I, I, I got tired. I got fatigued. I, I kind of gave up. You've heard the saying that fatigue makes cowards of us all. If I were being cruel, and I certainly didn't want to be, but really, he fumbled. He fumbled on the one-yard line. He fumbled with the chance to pass the bar. And I'm not saying that to rub it in. I'm simply saying that last week I talked about how you were one answer away. Now I want to talk about what happens when you fumble that one answer and how you can make sure that doesn't happen. So I've got four things, four reasons why people fumble on the bar and what I think the solutions are. So I'm not gonna just leave you out there trying to figure this out on your own. Um, and, and I really do wanna say that for those of you who are Cleveland fans, yeah, you've got a way better basketball team and I'm a New Orleans Saints football fan, so we're not much better off these days, okay? Just to be clear. All right, so why do people fumble when it comes to the bar exam? Four reasons. The first is fatigue. Some people fumble their bar because they're tired. They're just wiped out. Why does that happen? Well, they work too hard to study and they don't pace themselves for what really matters. Again, to use our football or maybe a basketball analogy would be better. The winning basketball teams tend to rest their great players periodically through the season because it's a long season. They know that it doesn't matter quite so much if you win uh, every one of your 62 NBA games uh, because you've got another almost 62 playoff games. And so you've got to be ready and prepared when it counts. Bar takers sometimes tell me that they spend countless hours studying, cramming, reciting, memorizing, doing all of these things. And then they get to the exam and they're so tired and they're so uh, wiped out emotionally and physically that they just don't have enough energy left in their tank to be successful on test day. You need to pace yourself. If you're following our study guide, and this comes to something I said earlier today, you've got to be following that study guide as you see it. Don't add extra hours. Don't make more work for yourself. It's not necessary. And it has this counterproductive effect at the end. You're just too tired to do the work. So what are the solutions? Well, pacing is number one. The second thing I think is that you should be exercising. I think every day you should get in at least a walk or a swim or a bike ride, get on an elliptical machine, do something so that you continue to keep moving. It's really easy to get locked into the, the chair and the couch and to be studying all the time. And what happens is you actually begin to lose some of the muscle tone and the mental fitness that we've talked about elsewhere. And so exercise, even for half an hour a day, could be a huge difference. And if you don't want to exercise, and I get that, just get out and take a walk. Just take a walk. That alone is sufficient. You should also be getting enough rest. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, you know, I've got to stay up late to study or I get up early to study. It seems like my rest is going shorter and shorter. In general, I would say that anything under five hours a night of, of sleep is going to catch up to you. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it will catch up to you. And it will definitely catch up under the stress of the exam. So I would say a minimum should be five hours of sleep. How much at the top end? Well, probably seven or eight hours. Not more than that. If you feel like you need more than eight hours of sleep, go see a doctor. Something is not quite right there. Um, but if you're getting five to seven hours of sleep a night consistently, uh, then you're, you should be okay. If you're getting less than that, it's going to catch up. And then obviously nutrition. You've got to be eating right. You've got to be doing the things that give you uh, the, the protein, the lean burning mass that you want. Uh, you don't want to load up on sugars and, and carbs. Uh, you don't want to load up on coffee in spite of my uh, constant coffee drinking example. Um, you want to be eating right and you want to begin that process now. Don't wait till a week before the exam and say, well, now I'm going to start eating right. No, that's not it. Start now and start working progressively. Think about it. It doesn't have to be massive changes in your diet, but really, it's really hard to study after you've had a double Whopper cheeseburger with huge fries and a chocolate milkshake, right? I mean, that's just not really a good plan. So be careful about what you do. Now, we have um, in our course, as many of you know, a paraliminal package. This is a group of uh, 15 uh, specially uh, selected paraliminal recordings from learning strategies that are designed for bar takers. And these paraliminals are designed to help you uh, with the mental 
uh, uh, challenges that you might face to deal with specific problems that, that bar students encounter. And I want to just recommend for those of you that have got the paraliminals or those of you that are thinking about them, some specific titles that might help with each of these uh, ways that you might fumble. When it comes to fatigue, the paraliminals that I would suggest would be uh, the one that, that we've got in our package called Recover and re-energize. This is a great one. Uh, when I feel really tired, whether it's because I've, I've worked out or walked or done a lot or had just had an active day, this is a great 20, 25 minute recovery uh, program. I just put it on, close my eyes, wake up 25 minutes later, I'm much better off. There's also a great one if you don't have 25 minutes that's in the package, it's called the 10 minute supercharger and it literally is 10 minutes and I love doing it. You can do it sitting in your chair. You don't have to be lying down. Uh, it's a great way to recover and re-energize. So in the lunch break of the bar exam every day, I would go someplace quiet, go back to your car, sit down someplace, put that on with headphones, listen to the 10 minute supercharger. It is a great um, you know, opportunity to, to get yourself back into the game and, and to not have the fatigue. Now it's interesting, you know, uh, when they asked Biner after the fumble, what happened? They said, were you tired? He said, well, it's been a long game. I mean, I, I, and he'd had a lot of carries. I think fatigue was part of it. Um, I'm going to get to some other things that he said as well later, not to rub it in, but just to say that I think fatigue is a big part of what happens, why we make mistakes. Well, the second reason that I think we make mistakes, why we can fumble on the bar exam is fear. The first was fatigue, but the second is fear. You know, I think there are things that you're afraid of when it comes to the bar that we're all afraid of in life. I'm afraid of snakes, I'm afraid of fish, I'm afraid of crazy bar takers, I'm afraid of a lot of things. Um, you know, that's just who I am. <laughs> but you've got your own list of fears. But here's the interesting thing. When you give your fear, when you give it a name and you call it out, when you face it, it actually loses a lot of its power. Now, if you are uh, someone who uh, is theological and you uh, read a Bible, you know that there is a lot of uh, information in Scripture that says you got to name your demons, you got to face them, you got to call them out, you got to bring the the devil out into the desert with you, and you got to say, "I'm not going to do that." All right, but giving it a name, giving the fear a name, is incredibly valuable because what happens is when we don't identify what we're afraid of, it just grows, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And until we actually open the box and see what's in it, we've made it out typically to be worse. So we make these fears greater and bigger than they really deserve. Now, one way that you can face those fears, whatever they might be, it might be the fear of failure. It might be the fear of embarrassing yourself or the fear of looking silly or the fear of uh, having to tell your friends and neighbors that you failed the exam or the fear of uh, not getting the job you want or the fear of losing, uh, you know, not being able to make your house payments or, or to buy food or whatever it might be. Those are all real fears. But when you actually name them and identify them, they tend to be a little less valuable. Sometimes I say to students, if you failed the bar, would you be homeless tomorrow? Would you be unable to eat? And the vast majority of them say, no, that's not the case. That wouldn't happen to me. Okay. All right. It would be a bad day, an awful day, but you'd still be here. Now, I recognize that there are some people that go beyond that. And sadly enough, we're seeing more and more stories of bar takers who hurt themselves or commit suicide or attempt to commit suicide. That's the ultimate in letting the fear control them. There's no reason for that. Literally, you can control this if you simply give it a name and identify it. One of the ways that therapists deal with this is to ask people to write their story, to tell their story. I'm gonna link later to a, a, a video I did about telling your story. It's a pretty uh, useful uh, explanation, I think, of this process. But it's something that was first used with um, combat soldiers who had PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And by writing their story out, by writing what happened, and then rewriting the story as to what they saw and what they wanted to have happen, it actually gave them power over the things that they were afraid of, the things in their current life that made them fearful. Writing out and telling your story can be an incredibly effective tool when you've had a failure. So if you're repeating the bar exam, it is actually valuable to sit down and write out what happened during that exam. Get it on paper, look at it, be objective about it. Then go back a few days and write it down again. What do you remember again? And then do it again a third time. What you'll begin to discover is that the, the power that that narrative has in your life starts to diminish as you do that. As we get rid of some of those stories, as we start to look at them squarely in the eye, the fear goes away. 
So don't let your fears control you here. I recognize that you might be afraid, but you don't have to let that happen. Now, if you're using the paraliminals, there are a couple that I think are absolutely spectacular for helping deal with fear. One is called anxiety free, and it is just great. You take whatever it is you're afraid of, fear of flying, fear of penguins, fears of, you know, ladies in red hats, I, I don't know, whatever. And whatever that fear is, you address that, you make that the intention that you want to deal with. And then the paraliminal helps you work through it. And you listen to that paraliminal, it's again, about 20, 25 minutes long, listen to it every day for three or four days, and then periodically once a week or so after that, and it makes an incredible difference. Um, another paraliminal that I really love, if you've got the collection, is called belief. This one is sort of the antidote to fear, right? I'm afraid, but if I believe, and, and it's not belief in a person or a thing, it's, it's belief in yourself, it's belief in what you're doing, it's, it's generally having belief. It can make a huge, huge difference in what you do. Um, you know, when you talk to, to great athletes, they'll tell you that they believed in themselves, they believed they could be successful, that they didn't want to feel fear in that moment, right? And I think that that is absolutely critical here as well. So the second reason I think people fumble is sometimes because of fear, but you can deal with it, you can overcome it, you can manage it and corral it, and you can put it away using some of these paraliminals. Well, the third way that you can fumble is what I call fantasy. Hey, I had to come up with another F, but this is a good one, fantasy. What I mean by that is some people fumble because they're delusional. <laughs> they think going in that they don't have to be realistic, that they can just, you know, kind of, you know, be wonderful and show up and they'll pass the bar. They're in a fantasy. And then they get into the exam and wham, it hits them like a blindside uh, blitz from a linebacker. That'll mean something to some of you, the rest of you forget it. <laughs> But basically, the idea is that they're not very realistic about what's going on. So how do you become realistic? What does that mean? Well, I think for most of us who are not truly delusional, when you're studying for the bar, you want to be realistic about two things for sure. One is your time, and the other is your circumstances. Now, I said earlier, I got a, an email question from a student that said, I'm just starting out. I feel overwhelmed. Uh, there's so much to do, and I've got family and work and kids and all these other things. Look, there are some realistic challenges around that person's time and their circumstances. You will not be able to study with a screaming two-year-old at your knee. It's the truth. So you're gonna to have to figure out some solution to that, daycare or a nanny or nap time or whatever it might be. In the same way, if you've overcommitted and you've got too many things going on, it's gonna to be tough. I spoke to somebody yesterday this is a great story. Uh, they were in New York for the Tribeca Film Festival. Their husband is uh, presenting a film. They're uh, working for an embassy in a foreign country. They're retaking the New York bar exam for the second or third time. Uh, they're a foreign trained attorney, obviously. They travel around the world. They've got all these things going on. I thought I was talking to Amal Clooney. You know, I was like, oh my God, wow. There's a lot going on in that person's life. But what I loved was that this individual said, you know, realistically, I just can't get ready for the July exam. It's gonna to have to be February for me. That's exactly right. You don't wanna be fantastical about this. Be realistic about what's coming so that you don't get yourself caught up. Look, you can't fantasize that you're gonna pass the bar and not study. You can't fantasize that you're gonna pass the bar because you memorized every single rule and every single uh, piece of, of information. That's obvious. And yet, at some deep level, I think many of us try to do just that. So be realistic. What about paraliminals? Well, I love the paraliminal called Get Around To It. It is a procrastination killer. If you've been procrastinating because you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, there'll be more time in a week or two or three, you know, things will be better after this or, you know, after I graduate or whatever happens or my mother leaves town for the, you know, to, to leave me alone for a while, whatever. Well, get around to it will help you procrast end the procrastination. It's an amazing little paraliminal. You put it in, and the next thing you know, you're actually doing the stuff that you didn't want to do. Uh, I do this all the time. <laughs> There's so many things I want to procrastinate about. Um, but I put that on, I set my intention, and then I find myself doing it. Not because I'm thinking, well, I've got to do it now. I'm just doing it. So I really love that uh, if you're struggling with the fantasy, uh, and that's the reason that you're fumbling. And then the final reason that I think sometimes people fumble is focus. And this brings us back to Ernest Beiner. You know, his career never recovered from the fumble. 
uh, as great a back as he was. And when they asked him after the game and repeatedly, really, after that, why did what happened? What was going on? He said, you know, I think I lost focus in that moment. I was trying so hard to score the touchdown that I forgot to focus on holding onto the ball. And it happens. And it happens uh, uh, to a lot of athletes in a lot of situations, not to pick on him. But I think for bar takers, sometimes we lose focus. Here's what really goes on. We're trying to do too much. We're trying to focus on our family and our job and studying for the bar and politics and, you know, uh, sports and, 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 and. So here's what you really need to do. You need to decide that when you are doing bar study, you're not multitasking. Now, look, I get that some of you are listening to lectures while you drive to and from work. If that's the repeat of the lecture, great. But if that's your sole time to be doing the lectures, it won't work very well because you're multitasking. You're not making that time what I call sacred time. And what I mean by sacred time is simply that we don't let anything interrupt it. In the same way, when you're at work, you should be working. When you're with your kids, you should be a parent. When you're with your spouse or your significant other, you should be that person. When you are you know, at church, be the person at church. In other words, pick your time and do that thing and do it as well as you can. And then when it's done, go to the next thing. See, I think what happens is we lose focus because we multitask. Now, I know some of you are watching this uh, video or listening while you're doing something else. And you're going, yeah, what did he say? What was that about focus? <laughs> Point made, right? You got to keep your focus. And if you lose focus, it's really, really difficult. So schedule your time, make it sacred. And then be objective about why you're doing this. Remember last week I talked about your one answer away and I got an incredible response to that. People really, uh, I think it resonated with so many of you because I talked about the why. Why are you doing this? You know, there's gotta be a good why, a good value and reason for why you wanna be a member of the bar. And when you've got that value and reason, when you know why you're doing something, it is really easy to focus on it because it matters to you. The things that are trivial, anyway, it's a not, you know, who wants to focus on trivial things? But if it's significant, you're going to focus. And that's really what we want you to be doing. So be sure that you know why you're doing this. Be clear on that. And I think the focus comes with that. In terms of a paraliminal, well, there is one that's called literally focus and concentration. <laughs> it's great for that. It's absolutely terrific to help you to lock in your focus and get it uh, in place. There's another called peak performance and a third called power thinking. They're all designed to help you with focus, to make sure that you're actually locked in, working on a particular op topic at one time and doing that. So if you're losing focus, those paraliminals can be really helpful. Well, here's the thing. Um, you know, the Cleveland Browns uh, never really recovered as a football team from those two years. Uh, Kosar never got his championship. Uh, he kind of drifted off into obscurity. Uh, Biner, literally his career was basically done after that game. Marty Schottenheimer, the coach of the team, left. Uh, never really had the kind of success anywhere else. It was a good football team. And P.S., Denver lost both Super Bowls uh, that they uh, got into by beating Cleveland. So I don't know, maybe they saved Cleveland from just uh, further humiliation down the road. But the fumble stays in lore. It's a bad, bad memory in Cleveland. It's a really great memory in Denver. You don't want to be the person who fumbles. And so as you study for the bar coming up, make sure that you're on track and that you're not going to fumble. Don't let fatigue, fear, fantasy, and focus ruin what you're doing. That's our message for this week. 